to see everyone here. It really is good to see Rhonda after after a year in hiding. Lockdown. Lockdown. You persevered and, and we're glad to see you back. Uh, open your Bibles if you would, Revelation chapter twelve. We'll go we'll we'll read verses seven through twelve. It's our text this week, so if you're able to, please stand and be an honor of the reading of the Word of God. Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 7, says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war. And they did not prevail, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down, at the one who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb, and because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even when faced with death. For this reason, rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you with great wrath, knowing that he only has a short time. Would you pray with me, please? Great are you, Lord, and worthy to be praised. Father, we ask that you just hear our, our worship, that you hear our songs of praise and our interpretation of scripture we pray father that your spirit will provide the illumination that we need and we ask father that as, as always that you receive the glory we ask in jesus name amen, amen. please be amen. seated i had mentioned to you earlier that there will be a time when we get into things where the the perfect sequence of Revelation is a little interrupted and some things will go backward and forward and some things like that. And there will be some things that, that we just cannot uh, pin down on, on a firm timeline. This is, this is one of them. Um, we can, we've got some ideas and, and as normal, I think it's kind of like my job to help make some guesses for you. Um, but we'll do it at that at a minimum. But there is a lot of interweaving going on and I'm going to go back with some stuff ideally if you study the end times if you study what's what at seminary we refer to as eschatology if you study the end times you you basically should start with the book of Daniel this which is what you guys are going through uh, in, in, in the Bible study on Tuesday nights and and, and from there, once you've completed that, then you would, would go through 1st and 2nd Thessalonians and then Revelation. This is probably, and that doesn't complete it, <laughs> but that's probably the best way to do that. And we kind of went through 1st and 2nd Thessalonians and the Revelation in here, and then uh, you know, Daniel will serve as a complement to some of you. Um, but it, hopefully it will help make some things um, a little bit more understandable. But as we go through this, you'll see, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a little bit of a dip into Daniel today uh, as we go through this. I'm not going not gonna to go into great detail, um, just because Gail can do it better than I can on Tuesday nights. So uh, that's, that's just something that I think will help some of these things uh, make a little bit more sense to you. So this, this chapter only has 17 verses. But is sweeping in, in, in its content goes all the way from the past back to when, when Satan fell, as we saw uh, previously, and then all the way to the future and then to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is kind of like 
This little chapter is 17 verses, but encompasses all of human history. So it's pretty powerful stuff, isn't it? So, doesn't give us a, a great detail as, as, as much as some of us would, would like to have, but it gives us enough information to sweep throughout human history to understand the great raging war of the ages that's gone on, as we mentioned last week, between the forces of God and the forces of Satan. Good and evil have always been with us and they will continue to be with us, but there will come a time when that, that war will be settled. And we also know here there are some things that bring us terror and there are some things that bring us joy. And that, that, this is the response of the wicked. There's the response of the righteous. And there's a lot of that here in this, in this chapter. And I'll try to give you the gist of it, and we'll just have to ask the Spirit to expand our understanding of it. But you probably don't know, or you don't think about this every day, Satan has never been to hell. Y'all understand that? In fact, he's not there now. He never has been there. Now, he'll end up there. We'll get there in... A decade or so. <laughs> we'll get there before too long. But when he finally does get to hell, he's not only going to be in charge there, not only not going to be in charge there, he's going to be the lowest being of all there. We have a tendency to think of Satan as being the king of hell. He's a fallen angel. And he's going to be dealt with. In fact, he spends most of his time in heaven. Doesn't, that's just not the way we picture this a lot of times. He was once the anointed cherub. He was exalted among all other angels. He lived in heaven with God. And even now, he still spends most of his efforts before the throne of God. And it tells us in verse 10 that, that he's there day and night. He still has access to heaven, and he's not yet sentenced to hell. That comes later. What this text tells us is that soon he's going to be sent out of heaven to earth, and ultimately after that, he will be sent to hell, and which is defined in the book of Revelation later on as the lake of fire that is prepared for the devil and his angels. Now his reason for spending so much time in heaven and for orchestrating his demons to propagate their deceptive lives is to accomplish what he has always wanted to accomplish, and that is the overthrow of God and God's purposes and God's plan and God's people, which sounds kind of like a thrifty, nifty little outline there, doesn't it? But Satan's plans are rather simple. He wants to eliminate anybody who is committed and works for the purposes of God. Doesn't matter if you're Jew, Gentile, doesn't matter who you are, if you work for God, He wants you to be dealt with. And if He could, He would kill us all. And better yet, He would destroy our faith if that were possible. He also wants to bring about the unification of the whole world under his rulership. And we'll see more about that in, in the next few weeks. This is going to sound vaguely familiar to some of you. He wants to be all that, but in fact he is only temporarily, and he, o he only runs over an unrighteous world, and he is the God of that world. He is the God of the unrighteous. He wants the entire world to worship Him. He wants to prevent Christ from coming back and establishing His kingdom, both spiritually in the hearts of men and millennially on earth and eternally in the new heavens and in the new earth. And even though He can read the Bible <laughs> and He knows the last chapter, He knows He loses, he can read his destiny as clearly as any of us can, and he understands it better because he understands the workings of God better than we do. He still fights, and that is the war of the ages. This is this ongoing, incessant, relentless war between good and evil, between sin and righteousness, the forces of God and the forces of 
Satan. Let's look in verse 7 and we'll see tension in heaven. Tension in heaven. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war. And they were not strong enough. And there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. Now, in spite of the way Hollywood likes to portray Satan and certain artists and some other things like that, Christians are to avoid him. And in fact, stand against him. We talked about this last week. He's not a cute little imp. And, and I've, I've got another point that I'll make later on. I mean, he's, there's a lot more power here than, than, than what we probably give him credit for. The name Satan and the word devil, I found this amazing, only appear 79 times in the Bible. Most of those are in Job, Revelation, and the Gospels. The New Testament writers gave specific instructions on how the church should view Satan. Read these for you. 2 Corinthians 2, 10 and following. But one whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. There's also from Paul, Ephesians 4, 27. And do not give the devil an opportunity. And also we can find James 4, 7. Submit therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will what? Flee from you. So this struggle between supernatural beings in the heavenly realm will climax during the tribulation. Now, next week we'll see Michael and other angels with him fighting against the dragon and Satan is the one who draws first blood. The greatest difficulty in the interpretation of the struggle is not how or exactly where because we have limited information on both. The greatest issue is why. Why? And we can't be sure about this, but I'm going to give you a little bit of a, of a speculation on this. The, what we saw when we studied in 1 Thessalonians 4, the rapture may actually initiate this struggle. It's possible that as raptured Christians travel through this sphere, the prince of the power of the air and his demonic army will try to stop the us, which may start the battle between Michael and the demons. Now, if this is indeed the time of the rapture, or around that time, then we assume it's somewhere around that time when the war breaks out, and if it's triggered by the rapture, then the end result catapults Satan and all of his hosts out of heaven and down to the earth. And that explains why the tribulation is such a terrible time. Because now all the demons of the universe <laughs> have hit the earth. They have no more access into heaven. Literally, verse 8 says, no longer was any place found for them in heaven. So no longer can they come before the throne of God. No longer can they harangue about the sins of the saints. Now let's look right quick. We'll take a little tour through Daniel. Um, and just go over some things. Daniel 9 speaks of that same period of time. And Jesus spoke of it in Matthew 24 and then again in Luke. And so that time is coming in which God is going to pour out judgment on the world. And when he does that, the battle isn't going to end. In fact, Satan is going to be devastatingly more active on earth during that seven year period than on any time, any other time, because the theater of his operation is going to be confined to the earth. You'll notice that in, in the text it says the great dragon, back in verse 9, is thrown down. It's thrown down. Verse, chapter, chapter 12, verse 7, Daniel has a, another vision. This is Daniel, not Revelation. He sees a man dressed in linen above the waters of the river. He raised his right hand, his left toward heaven, and swore. And it says, he who lives forever there will be time, times, and half a time. So that's one plus two plus a half equals three and a half years. 
So they're talking about the tribulation, the three and a half years. In that setting, the time of the end. Now, in Daniel 12, 4, we see the end of time, which is the time of the return of righteousness, the time of the resurrection of life everlasting, the time of the judgment of disgrace and everlasting contempt. Down means down to earth. And it says at the end of Revelation 12, 9, and his angels were thrown down with him. And what makes the tribulation in part so horrible is not just the judgment of God, but it is the arrival of Satan and all of his fallen minions landing on the earth. So that actually signals the end of Satan's time as prince of the power of the air and his whole operation is confined to the earth. And of course, that means all the demons are fully occupied here in this very place. So this horrifying, indescribable, unbelievable period of time is awaiting the world of unbelieving men and women. Now I've got about three more verses here from Daniel. Let me just run past them right quick. Daniel 10, 13 says, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was standing with me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I had been left there with the kings of Persia. So here we have a holy warrior angel opposing a powerful demon. Go down just a few verses, Daniel 10, 21. However, I will tell you what is, in, what is inscribed in the writing of truth. Yet there is no one who stands firmly with me against these forces except Michael, your prince. And then a little later, there's another mention of Michael's defense of the people of God. Daniel 12, 1. Now, at that time, now what time is that? That's the time of the tribulation. It's the time of the kingdom. Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. <laughs> I mean, if you wanted to, you could, you could write a, a pretty nice size article on Michael that we don't really pop up, we don't quote these verses all the time. The little book of Jude, which comes right before Revelation, verse 9, refers to the fact that Michael is kind of like arguing for the body of Moses. And he's having this argument with Satan. And Michael kind of backs off. So there's a lot to think about. There's a lot that's put in there. There's a lot of theology in that one little verse. Michael doesn't have as much power as Satan does. And, and somehow, sometimes we, we feel like we want to go head to head with Satan. Well, first off, you're not going to go head to head with Satan. You're going to go head to head with one of his demons. Secondly, you don't want any part of it. Even though the scripture says, and I'll come back to this a little later, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Don't ever be afraid of that. But don't go looking for it either. Now there are a number of things that might have caused them to fight, but let's suppose that what initiated this particular battle was the rapture of the church. That the Lord snatched the church away and then begins to pour out his, his judgment on the earth. And the church is in heaven represented by the 24 elders. And they're in heaven while this is going on. More people are being converted to Christ. And a new assembly of believers is called together that really are one with the rest throughout all of redemptive history. But uniquely, the church is raptured. And could it be that as Jesus Christ raptures his church to take them to heaven, according to 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, which we read several months ago, as they pass out of this earth in the twinkling of an eye and go through the domain of the air that they're passing through the kingdom of darkness, could it be that Satan and his demons are aroused to hinder that trip to heaven? So while we're involved in speculation, here's another one. Michael and Satan may have been familiar with one another. Since Satan was evicted from heaven along with a full third of the angels. 
battle during the tribulation may possibly have not been their first face-off. Michael is always associated with war and conflict. He's not a messenger angel. He's a warrior. He is one bad dude. And that angel who got stuck for 21 days, that we just read from Daniel 10, some kind of angel, even his voice was like the sound of a turmoil. His arms and his feet were like gleam of, of polished bronze. His eyes were like flaming torches. I mean, this is just some amazing creature. When John mentions the dragons and his angels, he underscores the idea that the demonic army is under Satan's command. And again, we see the literary device of repetition for the point of emphasis as he repeats this business of waging war and waged war. So the battle is going to be furious, and this is John's way of making sure that his readers understand it. Now, this particular translation is a bit wooden. It says to wage war. And that's kind of a rather dated English uh, expression. Ironically, the King James Version gets it right. It simply says fought. That's exactly what the word means in, in, in Greek. The Greek word is the root from which we get our word polemics, which basically means a fight. And I also think there's a better way to say not strong enough here. Basically what he's saying is they were defeated. I was just say he was found lacking in strength. They were defeated. And I think the translator here is trying to relay the intensity of the battle that comes out in Greek with the repetition of this phrase. This is winner take all. This is the big showdown. And all we can say for sure is Satan and his demons will be thrown out of heaven. And this could occur as early as the rapture, as we saw in 1 Thessalonians, but will happen before the great tribulation begins. Now, clearly, they will be harassing people on earth. And during the great tribulation, Satan's ultimate weapons will be aimed at anyone who belongs to and believes in Christ, but especially the people of Israel. Now let's move on to verse 9. We'll see a triumph in heaven. A triumph in heaven. Verse 9 says, And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And he's called great because he is so formidable. He inflicts pain. He brings disaster. Back in verse 3, we saw seven heads, ten horns, seven heads speaking of the sweep of, of, of human government throughout history. Ten horns, the, the final form of satanic human government. And he is the one in charge of it all. I don't mean to be flippant here, but Satan's got to be thinking this is kind of like deja vu. He's going to get thrown out of heaven again, but this will be the last one. He's identified very, very clearly. The serpent of old, and that's the snake in the Garden of Eden back in Genesis. He is called the devil, diabolos in the, in the Greek. And it means to slander, to, defy, to, do, to defame, to falsely accuse. And that's what he does night and day. He's like a prosecutor, if you will. Standing before the throne of God, trying to arraign God's people at the bar of God's divine and holy justice by accusing them of sins. He goes everywhere on the earth, collecting evidence. When Peter said that, that Satan goes around seeking whom he may devour, I think he's going to go around looking for evidence that he can take back before the throne of God that will cause God to turn his back on us. The one who is our prosecutor, unendingly accusing us, is unsuccessful. He's also called Satan, which is a very common Hebrew name or word. It also means adversary or enemy, which is a fitting description, is it not, of the enemy of God's people. And then it says an interesting thing about him, who deceives the whole world. Now, the use of the present tense here in Greek is an indicator that, that we should understand this as a continuing standard operating procedure. He, not only, he is not only an accuser, he is not only an adversary, but he is also a deceiver. 
Now let's look at verses 10 through 12 and we'll see a tribute in heaven. Verse 10 says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Christ have come, for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. They overcame Him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. For this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come to you, come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he only has a short time. Look back up at the top of verse 10. Now the salvation in, in its broadest sense, including the deliverance of all creation from the effects of the fall of sin and of Satan. And the power means the full omnipotence, the irresistible and triumphant, sovereign, almighty power which crushes all other might to establish the millennial and eternal kingdom and the kingdom of our God in its largest universal sense that is both millennially and eternally. So now the full, final, and glorious salvation we've waited for, now the great full power, now the absolute and eternal kingdom, and the authority of His Christ. The right to rule has come before because Satan has been cast out. They know this is the first step. Out of heaven to the earth, out of the earth to the abyss, out of the abyss to the lake of fire. This is step one in his move toward hell. The gate of to heaven, forever barred. The saints rejoice over this one who accused them day and night being cast out. They know his end is near. This is praise for triumph in heaven. Once these demons and Satan are expelled permanently, and heaven is cleansed, cleansed of the foul demons, there is praise one great loud voice. And you can go back to chapter 4, you have praise in, in heaven in 5, you have, it, you have it in 7, you have it in 11, and we'll see it again in 15, we'll see it again in 19. Periodically throughout this book, heaven is praising because of what is happening. This time they're praising because Satan is being thrown out. Michael and his holy angels and the power of God are triumphant. Now the question is, Who's making this noise? Could they be angels? Well, they could be, but more likely they are glorified saints. They say the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. Because, see, here's, here's a tip. Satan does not accuse angels. He accuses <laughs> believers. Satan could not care less about holy angels. Satan is only concerned about us and damaging our reputation. Now the little phrase, our brethren here, is never used to refer to angels. They're referred to as fellow servants, but never brothers. That's a term that's reserved for those who are humans, who are believers. And so it seems that what you have here is a loud voice in heaven from believers that would be those representing the church and those martyred saints who have gone on to glory during the tribulation and they are rejoicing because Satan no longer can accuse them before the throne of God because he no longer has access. This would certainly be something saints would be happy about. And even though the glorified saints cannot be condemned, they care because they want to show love to God they want to show glory to God and they want to show their adoration and their worship. And it certainly is inappropriate for them while they're trying to worship God with all their heart and have their brethren on earth being incessantly accused of sin. And so they rejoice. And when we see verse 11, verses 11 and 12, the scene shifts from heaven and their joy to earth. 
Praise Him not only for what happened in heaven, but over what's happening on earth. When Satan hits the earth with his demon host, he tries to slaughter all of the believing folks and destroy the nation of Israel, but he is defeated. They overcame him. How? Incantations? No. Exorcism? No. Formulas? No. Bindings? No. Confession? No. Rebuking? No. They overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb. They overcame him because their sins were covered and no accusation would stand. No accusation against the suffering saints of the great tribulation would stand before the throne of God as no accusation against any believer in any age would stand. It is not that they had some kind of personal power on their own. No. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are spiritual, they are mighty, and greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And in us, the Christ, who is our advocate, the Spirit who intercedes for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. All of the accusations against us fall on deaf ears because we have been saved by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Secondly, because of the word of their testimony. Because they were faithful and devoted to Christ, even in a world engulfed by demons and cursed by God, their ongoing testimony never wavered. They were faithful no matter what was going on around them. No matter how consumed the world was, both in the curse of God and the fury of Satan, the wrath of heaven and the wrath of the pit, they were faithful. And their witness was clear, and they never wavered. And then he says, thirdly, they did not love their life even to death. So they were characterized and then justified and sanctified, and then they persevered all the way to the point of glorification. They didn't love their life even to death. They endured even death. <coughs> They didn't love agapao. They didn't love their life. They didn't will to love their own life. They were willing to die. They overcame because one, they had a true faith. Two, they had an ongoing testimony. And three, they endured. They endured. These are all evidences of a genuine transformation. And we have to ask ourselves, is my life characterized in this way? Would we be characterized like this? So the devil only has a short time, but he has great wrath. He may have a little more than three and a half years, but not much. But, woe to the world when he hits the earth. He has great wrath. And he makes his last effort against God and his plan, his purpose, and his people. And he is aided by a pit, as we saw several weeks ago, that has spit out innumerable demons. And 200 million of them released from the Euphrates, as we saw a few weeks ago. That's why Jesus said there's never been a time in the history of the world like this. And if the Lord didn't shorten the days, everybody, including believers, would be destroyed. So throughout all of human history, Satan has fooled the world. And he will continue to fool the world during the time of the tribulation. He will carry on one charade after another, convincing people that he represents truth and virtue and true religion and even God. We'll see more about this. Revelation 16, 14 talks about spirits of demons performing signs who go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. That's how people 
wind up at Armageddon. They're deceived by demons into coming there. So, war in heaven becomes war on earth. So it's a fearful, fearsome time to come. It's not a time that I, frankly, would like to be a part of, nor would you. But even with all that Satan can do, with all of his might and all of his power, he can't touch us. Can he? We rejoice in that. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you for the fact that with powers that are so great, with a wrath that is so great, our accuser has already been defeated. If this was your plan before the beginning of time. You knew each person who would come to you and trust in you as Savior and Lord. And so we pray, Father, that even now, if there's someone here who needs to trust in you, who needs the assurance of salvation. I pray, Father, that you will draw him or her to you in a saving way. May you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mark and Taylor are here. They're going to lead us in a verse or two of a hymn of invitation. If there's anything that you want to do business with the Lord about, I'll be down front, so feel free to come and share. While they play and as they sing, you come.